world has changed. America has changed. If something were to happen tomorrow... How self-sufficient would you be? Could you grow your own food? Could you sustain your own livestock? Could you survive? This is the We Grow Our Show with Nick and Don. Nick and Don talk about everything from politics to planting. They cover techniques, methods, and tips on how to not only survive, but thrive. Visit the website at wegrowhours.com. Lock and load. This is the We Grow Hour Show. Get your grow on. Welcome back to the We Grow Hour Show. We've got a very stimulating episode for you. Woohoo! And by stimulating, I mean mentally. <laughs> Just to clear that up. <laughs> wow. Love where you take these intros. I don't know what to do. I'm trying to change it up. You told me last week I didn't have any energy. No, you were sleeping when I walked <laughs> in. So, you know, you didn't. But you changed it. All right, changed so, it up. Tried to. It was a good episode last week. I don't know if you oh, guys, yeah. if you get a chance, go back episode thirty-one, gasification perfection. It. I really enjoyed that interview. I was giddy as a schoolgirl yeah. the whole time. Oh, Mike knows his stuff. Oh yeah, yeah. So, and that's what's great is he he knows his stuff, and it's not like delivering a research paper when he's telling you about it. Right. He'll, he'll just explain it in normal terms. It's nice. Yeah, yeah. Well, today we are going to talk about aquaponics. Oh, yeah. I kind of like aquaponics. Why is that? I don't know. I just do. <laughs> it's just a passion. That's a good question. Why? Because I grow lots of stuff and I hate gardening, but I like this because I can tinker. I can do stuff. I can grow stuff. I don't have to get on my knees in the dirt. And See, see what just happened there, Don, is I put the ball yeah, I, on the tee I, I, so I that know. you could mention your company. Yeah. And you walked around it lollygagging, looking up at the field like that one kid that when we played baseball didn't know what he was doing. All right. Well, Ecopod Gardens. There it is. Is, is my website. We'll call that a base hit. Good yeah. job. And, and the show sponsor too. <laughs> yes, so, it is. Uh, yeah, we're going to have somebody on talk about aquaponics a little bit, get to the basics, um, just really how to get started, um, how not to get started. Like what kind of system you shouldn't start with versus mm-hmm. what kind of system you should start with. A lot of people like to start small. We're going to discuss that a little bit. Yep. So any good uh, happenings over the week? You know, yeah. Phew. Yeah, it was <laughs> Labor Day. Things. It was Labor Day. We had a good weekend. Um, got a bunch of cages built. Got my new shop up and running, and we will be shipping cages shortly. So shipping nationwide. That's uh, worldwide. Worldwide. Why, why stop at the nation, sir? Nah, you don't need to go worldwide. Yeah, I do. Nah. I'm going to own World this rock. dominance or something? Come on. Heck yeah. Yeah. No, and your cages are nice too. Yes. If you haven't, you know, come out to any of the prepper events or seen Nick's cages, I, I got to admit they are nice. So They're pretty awesome. I hate saying that because it's, he gets this inflated ego and, you know, it just kind of sucks. But Shut up, Don. <laughs> no, Smack you, you. Good stuff. Um, we've had some fun on Facebook recently. You guys have been been really helping us out. And I posted, this will be a, a last week, uh, 50,000 downloads. Yeah, yeah. I mean, <laughs> so thank you. <laughs> I don't know what else to say with that. I don't know. Just, wow, there's 50,000 times we've been listened to. Yeah. That's weird. Isn't it? 30 episodes, 50,000 downloads. We're growing every single month, month mm-hmm. over month. It's Please. a growth rate, like 15% or something like that per month. Yeah, it is. Yeah, 15 20%. Sometimes a little more, sometimes a little less. But, you we, know. We appreciate the attention. Yeah, and, <laughs> and keep sending feedback so we know what you guys want. Yeah. You know, what, what Mike, was was actually today? A, Mike was actually a uh, referral from one of our fans who said, hey, I'd love to hear from this guy. He's got a gasification deal going. Maybe you can have him on. So we did. So do that. Go send send the mm-hmm. voicemail tab on Facebook or the website or just shoot us an email. Uh, we grow ours at gmail.com. Say, hey, this is what I'd like to hear about. Uh, we want to hit, you know, kind of that broad audience of different things. Gasification may not be your thing, whereas oils may be. Or, you mm-hmm. know, we like to concentrate on food and growing food, but also alternative Sustainability energy. and independence. Independence. That's, that's what we're after. Absolutely. We so, want to help you guys hit those sustainability goals. Yeah, whatever they are. So speaking of Facebook, who was it that posted? I It came across on my phone. I was with a customer and it said, you guys suck. And then it went dot, dot, dot. I'm like, 
Oh, well, that was positive. <laughs> <laughs> and, then I, and then you scroll over and he was just kidding around. Who was that? I don't know. Now I'm going to have to look uh, because course. I don't know. <laughs> it was like Tom something. Yeah. Let's see if I can pull it up real quick. Uh, Tim Rogers, maybe? Tim Rogers. That's who it was. Yeah. And <laughs> I looked at it I was like, oh, thanks. <laughs> Jerk. <laughs> No, no, we that, we, we love, that's that's about the most entertaining thing ever. When yeah, you guys suck. Great job. <laughs> I want gas. <laughs> well, and one of the things we didn't mention last week, if you listen to the gasification episode, is we talked about this thing, this generator that he has runs on fuel on wood. Uh huh. It also runs on gas. Yeah. So it's either or. This generator will run on gasoline. See, we never we never covered that. I know. I, I saw I, in the picture that the bowl of the carburetor was still on it. I went back. I was looking a little bit more and looking at the research. And he says, you know, you can run it on gasoline, which comes with it as well, not the gasoline, the tank. So yeah. you can have a gas tank with this thing or you can have wood. I mean, that's pretty cool. I wonder if you can take and pour the gasoline on the wood to light it. I don't, never asked him how you get it started. Don't think, Don. You're that, just How no. do you get it started? Um, because well, with, with yours, with the one that we tried to do, man, we were out there blowtorch in the dang thing. Mine had a design flaw because I will smack you. I will work. reach, I will <laughs> shove that microphone up your nose. <laughs> Keep it up, buddy. Yeah. <laughs> no, the, the design flaw was I didn't want to drill into, uh, drill into and try and weld cast pipe. If anybody who's ever tried to weld anything that's cast iron, it does not work you got to superheat it and keep it consistent otherwise it snap crackle pops right. it goes all over the place so in, to get around that i put the air intake from above down in and i didn't put a butterfly valve on it or anything so it was just straight oxygen all the time anyway so there was some design flaws i think with his you go in from the side and you can use propane to light those things just a propane torch yeah. well i also didn't realize that you could harvest the gas coming off if you're not running a generator, and theoretically you could put that into a tank, store it, or store it, and use it on a barbecue grill, or I mean that would make that would be awesome having a fill up a propane tank with that. I bet you get some nice mesquite smokiness coming out of it. it yeah, it was a joke. I yeah, I'm <laughs> trying. It's got to be better I'm than s- rabbit shit. I'm I'm sorry, Don, <laughs> that uh, I'm not used to jokes that funny. Yeah. All right. Anyway, <laughs> so we're gonna have Roger on. Um, He's a gentleman who runs a group on Facebook called True Aquaponics. One of the few groups on Facebook I found actually has good information. And Roger really works hard to keep the bad information off and to keep the sale stuff off. Mm -hmm. So if you guys get a chance, facebook.com slash true aquaponics. What will you do when your stored supplies run out? Are you prepared? Hostel Hair provides equipment and education you need to control your own infinite food supply. We have live food storage systems, rabbits, quail, and other urban livestock for any situation and strategy. Don't be limited by what's on the shelves. Get started with an infinite food source today. Get prepped, stay fed with Hostel Hair. Call 480-331-3761 or visit HostelHair.com. All right, welcome back to the We Grow Our Show. We got a special guest with us. We've got Roger from True Aquaponics. How are you doing today, Roger? Absolutely fabulous. Oh, that's that's what I like to hear. So but when we were off the the air there, you said that you had some uh, hairy situations you had to take care of. Everybody doing okay over there? Absolutely, everything's perfect. Uh, when the wife says jump, Roger jumps. I can guarantee it happens that way every time. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, my wife she's she's actually submitted and said, Nick. You're the head of the household. I'm like, oh, wow, that's great. Thanks, honey. And then she follows with, but I'm the neck. Uh, <laughs> yes, yes, ma'am. Okay. <laughs> and Roger, I married a redhead, so I don't even need to go into detail. <laughs> <laughs> and thankfully, Absolutely. thankfully, we already know that our wives don't listen to the show, <laughs> so we're, we're off Scott clean. <laughs> Scott free. So... Uh, Roger, one of the things I wanted, to, reasons I wanted to have you on is to help our fans understand, our listeners understand aquaponics. Um, you have a Facebook group called True Aquaponics, and it's one of the few out there that I actually respect in this industry. Um, I've been doing aquaponics now for about 10 years. Um, I know you've been doing it for a long time, and you've got some products that you kind of help with, but you keep this group on task. 
you keep it uh, clean, and you keep it educational. So I thought, who better to be on than Roger? That, that's beautiful to hear something like that. It, it was very important to Terry and I when we first started the group last year to try to maintain exactly that, primarily the educational side, and keep uh, you, most of the groups you see out there. Unfortunately, you see people come in, and, and they're just selling everything you can imagine. Uh, and not just for Aqua Fox, but for anything. And we didn't want that. And we, we spend an unimaginable amount of time making sure that doesn't happen, making sure we do, like you said, stay on task. And so far it's working. We, we've been here for a year, just, just right at a year now. And we're pushing quite a, quite a large membership. And I've had very few complaints. And usually it's a complaint of when I'm not near a computer and we have a spanner hit us and it's taken care of very quickly. Right. Now, you don't only run an aquaponics group. You actually do aquaponics, too. Absolutely. So, uh, we, go ahead. Well, I was going to say, tell me a little bit about what you do, and um, let's let's kind of talk to people about how we get started in aquaponics. I, my, my biggest thing to point at people when they get ready to start an aquaponics, and not everyone can do it, uh, but if you can start with at least a 250-gallon system, and when I say 250 gallons, I'm talking about the fish tank volume is 250 gallons. Okay. And the reason for that volume being the bare minimum is that the stability of the system will be much greater. Anything less than that, you start looking at pH swings and nutrient swings that are hard to control. Absolutely. I, I agree with you. And I think it's the biggest mistake that's made when people get into aquaponics is they'll buy a 25-gallon fish tank and try this, and their pH swings all over the place. The ammonia is really hard to control. One little thing goes wrong, and the system is gone, and it can happen really quick in a small system. So in aquaponics, there's, as, as you know, there's only two things you can do. You can filter or you can dilute. At 250 gallons, you've got enough dilution in there to, to keep the system stable through most small changes. Is that kind of how you see it? Correct. That, that's absolutely correct. Uh, and, and one thing to point out, even whether it's a small system or a large system, sometimes folks will overreact to an issue. So let's say we have an ammonia spike. Uh, they'll come in with, with different chemicals trying to fight that ammonia when all they really need to do is look for possibly a dead fish or look at possibly their feed, overfeeding their fish because temperatures have changed. And that, that's very important to understand uh, as you go into – uh, from summer to fall and then in the winter, when your temperature starts dropping, if you're still feeding the same rate you were here in the summer and your water temperature drops, you're going to overfeed and you're going to get an ammonia spike. Right. So when uh, a lot of times we in aquaponics, we're using IBC systems. What are some of the other things you've found as far as fish tanks that are acceptable for use in small systems? Uh, we have, have put together and seen put together uh, just a variety of things for small systems. I, I saw one gentleman that had three 55-gallon blue barrels uh, linked together uh, just with, with uh, three-inch pipes so his fish could move between them, believe it or not. <laughs> I wish I had video of that I could upload to the group, but it, it was quite something to see. His fish swung from one blue barrel to the next with them all three standing up. Uh, that was a very cheap way to go. You can pick those up for about 12 15 bucks each. Uh-huh. Yeah. Another another thing that I saw was uh, a gentleman down there, San Antonio, had dug a hole and he used an old sign, a, a, a roadside sign. Uh, and what he used was the banner that goes on that, and it's a vinyl banner. He dug a hole out, lined it with wood, and then lined it with this, this banner and made it a pond liner, which was extremely cheap. Yeah. So as far as keeping finish, it worked. Now, how's, uh, how does vinyl hold up in an aquatic situation like that? I've heard that the smellier your material, the, the worse it is for raising fish. Have you seen problems with using vinyl? Absolutely, I do. Um, and I, I, I told the gentleman that, and I think he's actually replaced it since uh, with Duraskrim, which is quite expensive, but well worth the investment, in my opinion. Um, is that like an EPDM or? Uh, I'm, you know what? You caught me there with, with me not having an answer. I, I've, I couldn't I, tell you exactly what it is, but I do know it's food safe. Yeah, oh, okay. I've, I've got links to it, and I can throw that up so people can take a look and, and go through the whole chemical analysis of it. So Perfect. And if they want to ask me questions about it in the group, uh, 
on Facebook. I'd be happy to answer whatever questions they have. We use it quite frequently. Uh, you, you know, and, and I've actually seen some of the systems you've posted uh, pictures of. They're, they're absolutely beautiful, too. So you do good work out there in Texas. Um, Thank you. So what are some of the other things that, that you're seeing? Um, let, let's maybe cover some of the mistakes that are made when people get started, and then we can talk about how maybe to avoid those. All right, well, let's go back. You said uh, that you were talking about the IBC systems. Let's go back and look at that one. The, the biggest mistake I see with an IBC system is the layout. And it, it's very unfortunate because IBCs are so cheap and so easy to work with. But laying those darn things out in a small greenhouse, like a 12 by 12, which is our very first system, I'm actually standing by it right now, it's very inefficient for your grow area. In other words, it's very hard to walk around. It's very hard to get into because you have to reach so far and you don't have, uh, it's hard to describe, but you don't have accessibility like, that you would like to have, and that makes that very inefficient. Now, is yours configuration, is it in a line, or are you, are you doing the three, the two and the one in the front? Uh, we've got the two and the one in the front and the sump underneath, and that that's where the issue is. Right. If it was in a line, if we had three grow beds in a line, and a sump tank, let's just say, uh, somewhere else, and then our fish tank off in another area, it would be much more efficient. Uh, unfortunately, in our original build, we didn't have the space for it. We had a 12 to 12, and this is all that would fit. Yeah, and, and I've been there as well. Um, I, I still use that system as my test system. So uh, almost exactly what you're talking about. And I will – let me kind of describe this to people. Um, when you put – you're almost creating a triangle out of the IBC tanks. And I'll post some pictures on the show notes for this. And the problem you have is in a 12 foot greenhouse, you've got what about a foot and a half on each side to walk through. When you build this thing, you're thinking foot and a half is perfectly fine to walk through. So uh, once you walk through this, the problem is that you get a lot of growth and then it can be difficult. And it seems Correct. when you first start, that seems like it's a really good layout and it's going to give you plenty of room to get to the back of the greenhouse. The problem is that once you plant things, especially tomatoes, cucumbers, et cetera, those grow. And it can be very <laughs> difficult to get past those plants without damaging them. And it can become quite a hassle. Am I, am I right on with that, Roger? You are absolutely 100% correct. Yeah. So really um, we see and, – and Murray Hellman is, is really kind of the, the granddaddy in my opinion of, of that system. I think a better layout, and it sounds like you do too, is to go in a line and give yourself enough room to walk all the way around the system. That's, that's correct. If you use IBCs, that would be the much better way to go. Yeah. Okay. Well, good good points there. How, how else are you seeing people get – you know, that – what else is, is big for you? How about media selection? Is that something that you're seeing a, a big issue with out in Texas? Oh, yeah. we Here in Texas, most of our rock that's local, uh, and when I say local, I mean dug local or, or in a quarry local, is filled with limestone. So it's, it's quite difficult for us to get a cheap media that works well. And what we've settled on and we have stuck with it, it was our first try, actually our second try. Our first try was River Rock that was full of limestone. Uh, and that's, that's all in the group shows the absolute failure of that thing. It was the pH just ran away. Then we went to Lava Rock. And we have had many people that haven't used Lava Rock saying, you know, hey, that's going to be rough on your hands. It's going to be rough on the roots. But let me tell you something. If you've seen any of my pictures, any of my videos, you've seen our stuff grows great. Um, the system we just finished for Miss Charlotte, for uh, uh, Charlotte Sutek, and she's on in the group also. Her stuff is outgrowing our stuff. So, and she's got better sunlight. The lava rock, in my opinion, and this is just my opinion, has a better BSA, which is the biological surface area, mm. because of all the holes in it. It's, it's just full of holes. And that allows that bacteria to get in there and do more than it would on a solid rock, if that makes sense. Yep. Now, I, I love lava rock, and as far as roots not being able to handle lava rock, that's just – it it's not the case. I mean, flat out, that is not the case. Those roots are stronger than, than you think. Um, they will go through concrete. They will do anything they can. Those roots are strong. So that's not the issue. The only issue I have with lava rock is is the fact that you have to wear gloves and – 
and it does hurt your hands a little bit. At least in, in the, the ones I've used, it cuts, it cuts you up a little bit. I like the Hydrotin, but the price point between the two is worth a few scrapes on your hands if you're, if you're, <laughs> if you're getting started here. Right. I, I agree with that. What, one thing we have found that helps with the lava rock, the one we're getting ready to plant, I just go ahead and just flood your bed. You know, pull, if you're using auto siphons, go ahead and pull your bell siphon out, pull that bell out, lay it somewhere. Let it flood. Once it's flooded, get in there, start pulling rock, and you'll find that that rock is much easier to move around, and you don't get near scraped up. You got it. Absolutely. Now, speaking of bell siphons, Roger, what's your favorite? Do you is that your favorite way of doing it? Is a bell siphon, or have you found something else that works just as well? Right now, the bell siphon has done us well. We we've got three bell siphons in the original system that have been running now for. Um, Let's see, last July was, or this, this last July was a year, so just a year a month without a problem, unless we had a water flow issue. And then Miss Charlotte's been up for three months now with a much bigger setup, and her bell siphons have been flawless. So I, I, I love the bell siphon. There are other things out there that work. I haven't tested them yet, but I will be. And when I do, you'll see it posted all over the Facebook group, uh, showing exactly what results we get and how they work and, and what mistakes can or cannot be made with them. Very good. And I'm, I'm a big fan of Bell Siphon as well. I do want to ask you one quick question about the Bell Siphon, and I don't know the answer to this, but you may. What is the largest bed size that you can go on a single Bell Siphon? You're, you, yeah, you, I don't have that answer. <laughs> Miss Charlotte's beds are 2 by 12, 1 foot deep, and she's using a 2-inch stand pipe with a 3-inch bell. And I, when that thing goes off, it just blows the water out and sucks it down really quick. Um, how big can it be? What's the recommended biggest size? I would have to defer to somebody with a little more education, but I would say that that two by twelve is pushing the limit. Yeah, I I, I have uh, that's about as large as I've gone is about two by ten. And and I feel like I'm right near at the edge there, so I'm just wondering <laughs> so if you if you'd hit that yeah, edge. I, I feel the same exact way. I feel like I'm right at the edge. Awesome! I like living on the edge. And speaking of on the edge, uh, we're trying a new system, uh, trying to integrate mammals into aquaponics. Now they're not going to be swimming with the fishes or nothing, but we want to try and incorporate the waste. Uh, have you or know of anyone that has tried that before? Did you say mammals? Mammals, yep. Specifically rabbits. Um, yeah, you know, there's, there's a lot of fear out there about what, what, uh, mammal poo carries. Uh-huh. Uh, specifically E. coli. Now, whether that's a problem or not, honestly, I don't have that answer. Okay. Well, we, but I think if that, go ahead. I, that's one of the things that, that we're definitely battling. Um, like, I mean, I, I don't have that problem in my system or anything, but I've, I've, that's one of the concerns is that we don't want to put an active bacteria that's harmful where our vegetables are growing and can, uh, basically become infected with it to where we could eat it and ingest it. Um, correct. Uh, the only way I know of to kill an active bacteria is heat. And by the time you heat that poo up to the point where the bacteria is dead, the poo's dead too. Yeah. Yeah, we've been playing around with it a bit. I think a while back I had actually posted, uh, Nick was on Doomsday Press, on Doomsday Preppers, and I had made a post to the group beforehand saying, when you see this episode, do not go add rabbits to your aquaponic <laughs> system. It will destroy it. <laughs> so I want to make sure people aren't just running out and saying, oh, yeah, let me take my rabbit poop and throw it in my aquaponic system and see good things happen. So, um, you know, uh, hey, Ro- do you do any wicking beds of any sort? Actually, uh, we don't do any wicking beds, but we do have a few pots that we set up to wick, and they work fabulous. Okay. Uh, now, I am not using the best wicking material. There's better wicking material out there. We're, we're using just a, a real cheap, basic, uh, from any big box store, uh, potting soil that's it's mostly a wood fiber. That's what it seems to be. And it wicks up plenty well and, and grows, or what, you know, your plants grow well in it, but they're growing because of the nutrients coming from the system. Right, right. So uh, I, I guess let, let's get back to that get started. Um, 
if you're on a budget, what do you see as kind of the starting point to enter aquaponics? Um, how low can you actually make this? You know, figure in your purchasing IBC totes that have only been used for food grade uh, materials. You don't want something that contained Roundup. Um, what are you seeing as the average, you know, get into this price? Well, let's look at the high end of what IBC totes actually go for, which is about 125 for a uh, 275 gallon. And that, that again is the high end. We find them for about 55 to 70 around our area quite frequently, but we still see that 125 pop up from now and, you know, now again. Yep. From that point, you're looking at how big of an area do you want? Do you want to just use one IBC and take a chance of having a system that's a little bit too small volume wise? Or do you want to go ahead and bump on up to three? Uh, which is that triangular setup that we did first, which is uh, the Murray Hallam, which actually came from backyard aquaponics, to be correct. Yeah. That wasn't Murray Hallam to begin with, but it doesn't matter. If you bump on up, you're looking at buying three of them. So, worst case, 125 times three is 375. Then you've got a pump. If you look around, if you come to our group, we'll point you in the right direction to get a refurbished pump, uh, which would be a smart pump, a smart pond pump. Uh, probably about a 560 gallon per hour would do exactly what you needed. And that would cost you about, I think it's 22 bucks. It's pretty nice. cheap. So you're still under 400 bucks at that point. And then comes the big one, and that's your grow media. If you're going to use media, what are you going to use? If you're going to use lava rock, you're on the cheaper side. If you're going to use the hydrotonic horse or, or clay pebbles, you're on the expensive side. So that, that's kind of up in the air as to what the individual wants to use. All in all, to put together just a basic system, not talking about a greenhouse or grow lights or anything like that, you would probably max out around 550 600 bucks. And that, again, that's off the top of my head. Now, I, I'm, Seems uh, legit. Yeah, I'm, I'm right there with you. So let's go from there into... And and this is a question I'm asked a lot, and, and if anybody's listened to the podcast on, on the past episodes, they know my answer to this. So how much food can you grow in aquaponics? Depends on what you grow, where you're at, how much sun you get, how many fish you get. There's, there's a million variables. Right. So it's not a guaranteed 4,000 pounds of food per three three and a half no. square feet? Now, any, anytime somebody tells you you're going to grow this much food in this much space, chances are they're lying to you. Yep. Well, and Roger, that's why I have you on the podcast and not other people. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm not going to lie to you. I may, I may stretch the truth just a little, but I guarantee you I will not lie. Well, as I tell people, aquaponics is amazing enough. We don't need to exaggerate what it does. <laughs> well, I stretch the truth. It's usually about myself and not the aquaponics. <laughs> 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 so well played <laughs> absolutely i think we've all done that a little bit <laughs> so how about um mistakes as far as uh going shopping for these things what are you seeing i, I mean i i know i've run across people who've bought other systems uh i i run across a lot of people who've spent money on inaccurate information so what's the best way to maybe avoid that and to get the research side of things going into understanding how much time you're going to put into it, how much effort you're going to put into it, et cetera. What do you think the best resources out there are? Well, I'll be real honest with you. My resources were just the open web, YouTube, uh, hit a couple of groups to start with, um, and basically self-taught. Now, that doesn't work for everybody. Some, some folks want a book. And much as I hate to throw plugs around, I hear Sylvia Bernstein has a good book. I've never read it, so I can't say one way or the other. We've actually had Sylvia on, and and she's a, an acquaintance of mine. I I would recommend her book to anybody. It's a it's a phenomenal book. I, I spoke to her through email a couple times. She is a very nice lady, so I I got nothing bad to say at all. <laughs> uh, Murray Hallam's actually a member of our group. Uh, he's got some good videos out there. It is what I hear. Um, again, I haven't seen his videos. If he's written a book, I hadn't read it, so I can't say one or the other, but he's a really nice guy. Yep. I have been to his forum, and, and he, if you, if anybody's looking for a resource, his forum is a great resource because of all the experience that's there. Just like in our group, there's so much experience there. there with 3,600 plus members, if everybody in there only has one day of experience, 
that's a whole lot of years of experience piled up. You got it. You got it. Now, um, Nick, what what do you have? You know, I've I don't I don't know if I'm smart enough to ask this guy questions. <laughs> I I don't even know. I I guess. Uh, well, I'll I'll ask another question about disease and stuff. Anybody using turtles in their systems? We have a couple of members using turtles. Uh, of course, we had a lot of members that jump on those few members about it <laughs> for, again, the same reason of E. coli. Uh, but I've never seen anywhere that says for sure turtles carry it. Can they carry it? Yes. Do they carry it? I haven't seen that. Well, I think salmonella is their big one. and it, that, th- That's the one. I had it back. You'd think that maybe if, like I I actually went and spent some money and got my turtles tested to see if there was if there was salmonella on them and skin right. skin swabs came back negative but that doesn't mean that there wasn't something in the water right but I because it just I mean I've got so much I I raise rabbits and there's so much waste that I like to feed the turtles cuz they could turn it into an aquatic uh waste and then use all of that nutrients but uh, I think I'm going to keep them feeding my biofuels projects, and not my uh, not my biofuels are great. Yeah, and not not my eating projects. <laughs> well, and and that actually brings up a, a really good question, Nick. And and Roger, I'm sure you know this. Um, tilapia are by far the most popular in aquaponics. I think next to gold, goldfish and koi would probably be quickly following that. Um, what other species have you seen that are uh, fast growing and, and that you would put in an aquaponic system? I've heard some talk out there recently about eel, which I have not done, um, as well yeah, as other glass things. Eel. So. Yeah, the glass eel is something that a lot of people are looking at um, because of its high shelf price. Do I want a bunch of snake-looking things in my system and have my wife come out to feed them? Probably not. Uh, It'd keep it my wife out of what the they sell for. If, if one pokes its head out of water while she's feeding, it's over the greenhouse, the system, the meat, we're all gone. Oh, man. I love my wife. I don't really want to be gone. So no real fear. Is it possible? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, they're they're an aquaculture uh, systems that are, are growing eels uh, for retail. So yeah, that's possible. Uh, but our fa- if you if you're looking for our favorite species, we've got two of them. That would be, and of course, tilapia is way up there on that list for everybody. But tilapia is not native anywhere in the United States. Right. Yeah. However, channel cat and bluegill are oh, both man. native throughout the almost the entire United States and some parts of Canada. You are speaking that's my language. Favorite. Well, and you know, bluegill actually go by another name, and I believe that it would be panfish. And there's a reason Sunfish. they're called well, panfish too. Back east, it was panfish because they fry up in a pan really, really well. Well, panfish include your crap, your crappies, crappie. and all yep. of those too. So, so are you seeing a cross species between bluegill and and other, uh, you know, other fish out there too, Roger? If if I were to say the next most desirable panfish uh, would be something like what's locally known as a red ear, uh, but widely known as a, I think they're called muscle crackers. Hmm. And what what they do is they, they actually have these teeth or bones in their throat, and they will pick up a clam or a freshwater clam or a mussel in water, get it in their throat, and they will crack that thing open and eat the clam out of it. Wow. It's actually a muscle, not a clam. Yeah, I wouldn't want to get bit by one of those. <laughs> but, well, they're, they're small. They won't hurt you. The teeth are very small, but they, they apparently have very strong muscles in their, their – it's not a throat. And forgive me for not having the correct biology, but no. uh, they get those, those in there and break them up and, and eat them. And as far as eating fish, they are excellent to eat. Huh. So yeah. that's, that's, that's why I'd be looking at something that grows fast, ready to do. They are a hybrid, I believe. So, you know, some people don't want a hybrid. You don't want a hybrid, go with channel cat, go with bluegill, um, something like that, a sunfish. They grow really fast. They don't get huge, but they grow quick. They're very hardy, just like the channel cat and the bluegill. Uh, I hear tilapia are very hardy. We haven't raised tilapia. 
Really? Oh, really? Okay. Yeah, I, I will uh, attest to the fact that tilapia are very hardy. Um, in fact, I, I don't know if I posted it to the group, but one of – in our test system this year, my water was up to a little over 98, almost 100 degrees for a good week and a half. Um, sat around 98 degrees for a couple of weeks. And I have yet to have a single tilapia pass with that. I've had my water as low as um, 55, 60 degrees. And again, I have yet to have a tilapia um, die on me. So uh, it's a very that hardy fish. That is very interesting because I've, I've got one member down near Houston who has been losing tilapia like crazy. And they thought it might be a temperature-related issue. But at those temperatures you're talking about, it should not be. No, and and I'll tell you, and I haven't, uh, I don't know that person, but one of the big things to look at with tilapia, when your water starts increasing in temperature, your oxygen levels, um, your dissolved oxygen levels decrease. And I have seen a lot of issues with dissolved oxygen levels when you hit those temperatures. Correct. Um, so you've got to have some really good, I use a supplemental air pump and air stones in the system, and I have a pretty large drop on my feed into there for that sheer fact that um, I, I'm trying oxygen. to create some more oxygen in it. So as long as you're doing some things like that, you should be okay. All right. I got yeah, it. absolutely. Absolutely. I got another oxygen question. Oxygen is you. everything. You got it. Okay. Uh, freshwater prawns and crawfish. I love eating them. How do I grow them? Ask somebody else. I love eating them too. I'm with you. <laughs> well, I, I, I don't have your answer. I do know that your freshwater prawns are killers. And when I say killers, if they're too close to each other, they will kill each other. Sweet. They don't have to be male and female. It can be male and male, female. And, you know, it's a cat fight. Trust me. Really. So it might be yeah, better you to go with it. the crawfish because they seem to handle no, densities better. You need almost a square foot per crawfish. Really? Yeah. They're very Absolutely. territorial. Yeah, very territorial fish. Can that be done yeah, in Yeah, craw- crawfish are quite the same, but uh, the, the freshwater fawns are even worse. Yeah. Uh, I just I'll throw one plug out to a gentleman that is a, a member of our group, and I'm a member of his, a uh, strawhead farmer. He raises freshwater prawns, and he's good at it. And he shows people exactly how to do it and how few you can actually grow. It's it's quite quite a lot, but it's not the way I like to eat shrimp or prawns. It's not enough. <laughs> really? When we have a crawfish bowl, you know, two people, ten pounds of crawfish, and you're still hungry. Absolutely, I'm I'm right there with you. You know, you bring in a huge drum of crawfish. So let let me move on to one last subject before we run out of time. And I would like to know from you, as you got into this, what was your favorite part about getting started, and why are you still doing it? Wow, that's a, that's a loaded question. <laughs> um, my favorite part about getting started was knowing I was going to be growing something truly healthy for a change, instead of buying something from a store that who knows what's in it or on it or how it's grown. The reason I'm still in it, uh, you know, I don't have a really good, solid one answer. It's it's a whole bunch of stuff. Uh, but, but primarily, I guess I could say, because everything is so healthy, uh, everything tastes so good, so vibrant. Anything we eat out of the system, or any of the systems we built, is just... Uh, it's, I've been a dirt farmer all my life. I was raised by my parents to be that way, and I hated it. <laughs> but work, working aquaponics is is a passion instead of being something I hate to do. I love to go out and work in it once or twice a day, feed the fish, uh, pull water veggies are, are ready, plant new plants, pull old plants out, whatever I need to do, but there's no weeding. Yeah. That's a big one. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I do have, a, I do, and I'll be honest. I've got a few weeds that'll pop up every now and then. A bird flies through after you ate, a, you know, a seed and poops it out, and there it is. It happens. Yep. <laughs> but it's not constant. And and you just pull it out, and it's gone. <laughs> you, yeah, you pull it out, and it's gone. It's, there's there's if there is a root left, the worms eat it, and that's it. Yep. Yep. So actually, I'm glad you mentioned that worms. Um, if you're getting started. 
uh, let's let's run through that quick cycle process. And I, we're running out of time here, but I know worms are a big part of that. So take me through um, a startup of an aquaponic system. I go buy a couple IBC totes. I put the plumbing together. I do a three bed system. What are you seeing as far as your cycle times and kind of the best way to handle that? Because I know you cycle differently than I do. Right. There, there's a couple of ways to cycle. The way we cycle is actually with live fish. Some people do it without fish. Um, we use either minnows or goldfish or bluegill. Uh, we use bluegill on our first system. We use minnows on every system after uh, because they're so cheap, they're very hardy, and they do a great job. And when you get through and you put in your fish, they're going to stay. They eat the minnows. So it's, it's a win-win. It takes four to five weeks doing it that way to get through your cycle, and you are guaranteed to lose fish if you do it with fish. And unless, when you watch it, and you should be checking every day, when you get, you know, you start getting your ammonia spike, which is going to happen, then you're going to move into your nitrate or nitrite spike. When that nitrite spike happens, if you catch it quick enough and add some pool salt, and there's a specific formula for it, I cannot call it off the top of my head, but you add that salt that protects your fish, keeps them alive. Uh, the problem with that is the residual salt that's left in the system. Personally, using a really cheap fish, I'd rather let those fish die. I know it sounds bad. Use them in your ground, you know, potted plants or put them in the, the compost pile or whatever. Keep trucking along. Keep that salt out of the system. When you finish cycling, after about five or six weeks, you put in your, your good fish, which, you know, channel cat, bluegill, tilapia, whatever, and roll right along. Right, right. So that that's a big part of starting up is is deciding what you're going to do with cycling. I follow more along with Sylvia. I actually add ammonia to the systems, but my cycle times are longer too. We're looking at a nine-week cycle time um, rather than a four week cycle time. So we're extending our cycle, but we're not losing any fish. Um, it's, it's all how you right. do it. And there's no right or wrong here. It's just the way that you do it. So I think that's big for it's, starting yeah, up. Yeah. Um, figure absolutely. out ahead of time. Uh, Roger, it's been wonderful having you on. Um, everybody ought to go to True Aquaponics, his Facebook group. You do a wonderful job on there. And I appreciate all the time you've given us. Yes. Thank you, Roger. Thank you very much. Look forward to talking to you in the future. Absolutely. Hopefully we can have a shot at this. All right. Thanks Sounds so much. Good. Things just got real. The drugstore is closed and the doctor is unavailable. What are you going to do? Stock your medicine cabinet and bug out bag with nature's alternative, essential oils. Visit mylavenderlife.com for all your essential oil needs. All right. That was an awesome interview. I, I am so baffled with aquaponics. Like there's just so much that I want to know. <laughs> But I don't know what to ask because I, I mean, I've had a couple of systems start up, and right now I've got, I've got turtles, and and we've had that discussion. I know. You know where I fall on turtles. I know. He keeps yeah. asking everybody else we have on. I'm trying to find somebody else to say, yeah, it's completely fine. I'm like, fine, ha, we'll do it. <laughs> uh, so I already got the damn turtles. Yeah. So, but you know, it's it, it's it's interesting. It's fun. And I like that I have the excuse of, well, honey, I need 600 gallons because that's, it's harder, it's harder to fail when you've got more water. So I can have, in my backyard, I've got, I have four totes that are ready to go all with the tops cut out instead of cut off. Right. They're not right. cropped tops. They're actually full 275 gallon totes. And you can, uh, through the, the bottom, drain there you could always hook them uh, hook together. them together and, and and that makes a really good nursery tank that's one of the things when he was talking about the f the 55 gallon drums put together uh -huh. i would imagine as those guys grow you could somehow kind of feed them in in a particular tank which would get them all over there because uh, the fish will follow the feed and then kind of cut that off you know close that valve that's going in between or valve it off and then add your smaller fish and do that in the second tank, and as they grow, valve that off, add the smaller fish, and you have a really good rotation cycle. Um, I've or you done that, do that with, with netting, with with netting too, yeah. And I've done that with the IBC with two different IBC tanks. One is a nursery tank, one is thing, and and with that basic three bed system that is really a really good place to start and really good training system. It's still what I use for the test system, as you've seen it. Mm -hmm. um, that you've got a sump tank too, and that sump tank. Is, is really good for a nursery tank 
The problem is when you put it in that kind of triangle configuration, I'm going to call it, uh, it's, it's hard to get to the sub tank. Uh, so, you know, when you put it in line, you might want to leave part of that sticking out to where you can get into it. And if you can bury your tanks and use the earth t- to help them help keep it warm and cool. So another kind of good thing when you get started, which is, which is great. You know, in Arizona, where my house is at 10 feet is 55 degrees year round. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I've so badly wanted. Now that's a big fish tank 10 feet deep, but. Well, yeah, I'm just saying that the earth regulates heat. Yeah, much uh, better. Yeah. It's not going to get as hot and it's not going to get as cold. So Wouldn't that be awesome to have a 10-foot deep fish tank? Though? I plan to have at least a 5,000-gallon a tank when I yeah. – next house that I own, yeah. it'll be a 5,000-gallon tank. Barry, are you going to like bury one of those big cir- um, cylindrical – I'm going to create a pond. Oh, you're going to make a pond? Oh, heck yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah maybe a big cylindrical. We might bury mm-hmm. something like that. But it'll be landscaped as a pond and well, – yeah, absolutely. Like at my – I live in an HOA, this itty bitty little house. Right. And, uh, I want to turn almost a third of the yard into a pond. And that's only 500 square feet. Yeah. But 500 square feet, when you break it down, that's, oh, I had the math, 25 by, I can't remember it now. No. Well, you know, Scott fun. Yarish has a small yard too. He's got 3,000 gallons. I think it's 4,000. Four. Because he dug down a little bit. So it's pretty, it's, it's a little deeper in the mm-hmm. middle and then a little shallower on the ends. Yeah, it's, From it's what like I a remember. mini swimming pool. Yeah, I mean, so and and it's it's not very wide. It's probably what four feet wide, mm-hmm. I would guess, and kind of the length of the side fence. So you can do this uh, even a larger tank in a small area, and then he keeps his quail on top of him. Mm-hmm. And well, what I'm saying is 500 square feet, right? And then dig into that, and so, you're going up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you can dig down and you can raise it up too. You, there's you no put reason the dirt you somewhere be five six feet deep in that. Yeah. So it's a lot of water. It is. It is. And would be, you know, I want it because like swimming pools are great and all, but nothing beats a good old pond. You know, my, my dad's got this sweet, I don't even know. It's like, it's like maybe three quarters of an acre pond. Man. I'd love something like that. But it scared the crap out of me because I, I, I built this little Tom Sawyer raft thing. And I went, went out, out there, it. I went out there on the, on an oar and I'm like feeling there's nothing, nothing. All of a sudden I went, dunk. I'm like, huh, I wonder what that is. And I put it down again and there was nothing there. And that was a big dunk. <laughs> I mean, it was, it was, it didn't move. It was like, huh, somebody put a car in there. All right. Dunk, nothing. It didn't, I don't know what it was. It was either the biggest freaking snapping turtle ever <laughs> or I just barely hit a tree branch that I couldn't find again. Right, right. I don't. I think it was a snapper, though. That's I mean, funny. Well, uh, and and you know that's a whole different science is when you get into ponds. Mm-hmm. Oh, it's I bog mean, building. Yeah, you're not going to do aquaponics with a pond. I mean, you can, but it's not aquaponics. At that point, it's just At, borrowed when you get hydroponics. to a certain. Well, it's when you get to a certain size like that, it's got its own little ecosystem going, and there's a whole science behind that. So I think it's a little different than mm-hmm. than. What we're doing with aquaponics, which is... But could you still put grow beds in there and have them function? Sure, but you're going to have problems with stocking densities and other things. So one of the things in aquaponics you're doing, um, you know, we, we talk about starting at 200, I, I'd say 250 gallons and, and higher. So you can get away with one IBC. It, it, it's difficult, but you can do it. But as you get larger and you, you get more water in this, you're going to stock more fish, which means you need more grow bed. Mm-hmm. Okay. And... As you get to a certain point when you're getting 5,000, 10,000, 100,000 gallons of water and you're in a pond, you're not going to stock your fish to the point that the waste is going to be enough and, and, and you can't filter it from one point and bring it into your grow beds and, and do something with it. But nature will do it on its own. So as you get to a certain size, now you're going into a pond. Can you use the water? Sure. Is it going to be as beneficial as an aquaponics system? Probably not from what I've read. I don't know. And if I'm wrong, wegrowers.com slash ask us or send voicemail and you can tell me about it. But I think when you hit a certain size, you're going to start having some problems because of the stocking densities. Because you can't stock. You're just a fish farm at that point. Oh. And you'd need a huge amount of grow beds to filter that. Yeah. Remember, 250 gallons, that, that IBC system, you're looking at a about um, on the high end without any other filtering. You're looking at about 30 fish, tilapia, bluegill, whatever, full-grown fish, pound and a half size um, total. So 45 pounds of fish. And yeah, you really want one fish per 10 gallons. It's kind of the rule of thumb. Mm-hmm. 
you can go a little bit over that, but again, you've got to watch your filtering. So imagine doing that on a, on a scale where you're talking about a, a, a small pond, a quarter acre. I don't know how much water's in that, but it's a lot. Yeah, it's easily a hundred thousand probably. Yeah, so you're talking a hundred thousand or more gallons. You're not going to put a you know a hundred thousand. It's at least eight it, foot deep all the way across. I'm, right. I'm, I have to do the math now. So your stocking density, you know, you you get into the ten thousand fish and stuff. It's it's going to be a little much for something like that without the right filtering. So I I don't know pond science, but when you're starting out, which is kind of what the show is. You know, don't go for 10,000 gallons either. You can get a little bit too big. You want to keep that, uh, basically count the water as whatever size grow beds you can fit. So base your water volume on your grow bed, vol- on your grow bed size. We're, we've talked in the past on other shows about 12 inches deep being the magic number, uh, for many, many reasons. But when you get started, all I can say here is just trust me on this. You want 12 <laughs> inches of media, uh, Take the square footage of that grow bed and then go back from there as far as your size. So, and you want at least one cubic foot of filtering per fish. 250 gallons, 25 fish, 25 square feet of grow bed. Kind of the rough calculation. Okay. So I, I did the gallon. Yes, count. I know you did. What is it? 165,000 gallons in that little pond. Yeah. Yeah, so that's a little, but you know, at that point, you just take your fishing pole out and go fishing. Yeah. So well, wouldn't it be cool to have like a floating, a floating grow bed that you just put out there? Well, that you could do with fodder, all, depending on your temperatures. I don't see why you uh-huh. couldn't do something like that. But your fish are going to come up and eat some of your roots and stuff too. I mean, plants aquaponics is taking what nature does and and putting it into a, a containing it into a a system. There's no reason you can't. I guess if you've got three, raft out three there. quarters of an acre worth of pond in your backyard, you probably don't need to listen to this show yeah, anymore. Yeah, I mean, then you can irrigate <laughs> your soil with them. You can do all sorts of stuff. Actually, no, Farmer um, Jackson. Yes. Um, he's got two acre pond. Yeah. And I believe he, he listens. talking about that, yeah. Um, but he, uh, and he, I, I've seen the aerial shots of his place. I'm so jealous. Yeah. Awesome. He's out in Texas, isn't he? Mm-hmm. Yeah. He is. Yeah. So, all right. Well, I think that wraps it up for today. Uh, thanks for listening. WeGrowOurs.com, WeGrowOurs.com slash ask us, WeGrowOurs.com, send voicemail, Facebook.com slash WeGrowOurs, Twitter.com slash WeGrowOurs. We've got all sorts of resources. Come check it out. Hit the like button on Facebook. Help us. We're right at that 1500 mark. I really want to like double that. So <laughs> if all of you would just go click that like button and get us out to, you know, 3000, 5000 tomorrow, that would be great. That would be awesome. Yeah, we'd, we'd appreciate that. Hit the share button, you know. Go back and pick out an episode and share it from the website if, if you want, you know. Have your wife listen. Uh, ours I, don't, but maybe yours I have will. an idea. This is what I'll do. Yeah? When we hit 3,000, I will give away a three-tier rabbit cage. Whoa, a three-tier? You're yeah. going to give away a three-tier rabbit? Are you sure about this? Yeah. Remember Because I, I can, can only edit once. I can- <laughs> Three tiers. Yes. There can be one cage per tier. Yeah, it's still three cages. It is. That's an expensive system. I it mean, is. it's not a, an expensive system. It's, a, it's, uh, that's 300 bucks. 300 bucks. So we hit 3,000, I give away a $300 cage system. Oh. And we'll have a, we'll have a drawing then. I would think 5,000 would be appropriate for that. I, I say <laughs> three and three, because I don't do five, I don't do sets of five. You don't do sets of fives. Oh, I do, but it, it's. Well, we hit 50,000 downloads. So yeah, we need at least three thousand likes on the on exactly. The page. Come on, and seriously, the math isn't lining up. Why aren't you guys liking us? So that giveaway <laughs> is Hostel Hair, HostelHair dot com. Don't forget our other sponsors too, EcopodGardens dot com. That's me, Aquaponics. Um, go check out my website. I've got a little bit of information on there, but you can always find the number and give me a holler too. I'm happy to help you guys out, and you know, if you're local, I do consulting, and we'll even do come out to the place and design the system and all. So there's a plug for my business and uh, my <laughs> lavender life, butt out e-cigs. I got to tell you real quick, if you guys are still smoking, I don't know why you need to go do this other stuff. I know it's, it's you know, all these studies out there say it's not good for you. Well, neither is smoking. And if you keep smoking, you're going to die. If you start vaping, you just might die. I like those <laughs> odds. Um, so go out and freaking get a get a vapor, even if it's not from Butt Out. I'd just rather you go out there. Tell them we grow our sent you so we can keep them as a show sponsor. But I got a cool mod today. I'm excited to go home and oh, use the it. Oh, the copper. I got that called? copper. Yeah. 
Yeah, uh-huh. that is nice. And Matt hooked me up. I got number 10. This is a Dharma mod. Oh, I'm loving that. Mm-hmm. So I can't wait to, to get home and drop that in and see, see how that works. So if you guys are into vaping, you know, I got a full copper. So I'm happy. I got to go try it. Yeah, and those of you who aren't and think it's really nerdy, don't listen to Don. Nope, just avoid that. <laughs> but if you know somebody who smokes, and I know you do, send them to butt out E6. That's right. So, and we are looking for one more, maybe two more show sponsors, no more than that. So if you guys are interested or know somebody who is, love to, to hook us up with that. Uh, we've also got the Gompers coming up March. I know March is a ways off, but mark it on your calendars. Go reserve your tickets and come out and meet us. Um, We'd love to see you and meet you, and, and we're going to try to raise a couple bucks for Gompers for the garden program. So it's a noble cause, and I think it's important. What I else agree. you got, Nick? Um, quick shout-out. Uh-oh. I uh, left my wallet at home today, and all I had was my uh, uh, credit card. And I went into uh, Raising Cane's, uh, what is it, Chicken Fingers and things like that. It's on... I believe it's on McDowell. Oh gosh, it's in Phoenix. It's on McDowell and like 40th Street, yep. 40, 44th Street. 44th, yep. And uh, I drove right by there today. I, I went in there and I was all excited and I handed her the card. She's like, Can I see ID? I was like, Oh, I don't have anything but this card on me. She's like, Oh, our policy is like, Oh man. And I just told her it was my first time going in there. So the manager came up and said, This one's on me. And she bought me my lunch. Nice. And I'm pretty sure she wasn't flirting with me, but no, she can't. She could just tell you were a hungry guy. She, yeah, she just she didn't want to. She knew that you'd be a good customer. <laughs> it's like, oh, we got a fat guy here. We're going to lock him in. And it was delicious. It was awesome food, great service. And Fast food or? It's on the verge. It's not okay. quite like it's. Kind of like an El Pollo Loco or something yes, like that. Yes, yes, okay. but more Southern style, not Mexican. Gotcha. And the name of it? Uh, I believe it's Raising Canes. They Raising got a, Canes. 44th Street. I'll look it up, get it in the show notes. Small business shout out to them. Yeah, and tell them that, that the fat guy from the Uyghur R show sent you. There you go. And uh, maybe, you know, don't go in there and play the joke. That, oh, I didn't, I didn't <laughs> I have forgot my, my ID. I forgot <laughs> my ID. Would you just pick up the tab? Because that just wouldn't be cool. No, no. But uh, go, give them, go give them your love because uh, they're awesome. Nice. Very cool. Good food too. Oh, the sauce was awesome. Cool. <laughs> Anyway, thank you guys for joining us. Uh, We'll see you again next time.